Thank you for turning to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at that good friend of most D&D players, the dungeon. We're going to take a look at what it is to do a dungeon crawl, how to DM a dungeon crawl, and ways that sometimes it's better to have characters in a closed environment like a dungeon than an open environment like in the wilderness. I'm going to be discussing some of the other environments in future videos, but today I just want to focus on the pros and cons of taking your group into a dungeon. In this series of videos, I'm going to specifically be addressing groups from basically uh, levels 1 through about 5. And the pros and cons of being in each type of environment in those levels. I also want to remind everybody that I'm doing a uh, subscription drive right now. Trying to uh, get to that magical 1,000. You've really come through for me. I appreciate it. I'm doing very well on my way to that number, but I still need a little bit more to get over the edge. So if you've been... Kicking around, whether you want to subscribe or not, get, come on in. We, we talk about dungeons and stuff. And uh, I, I'd like to go ahead and, and clear that. I also have a Patreon going. And my first actual Patreon reward is going to be an AD&D serialized dungeon designed by me uh, that I'll be giving out a chunk of. I don't know if it'll be once a month, twice a month. I haven't decided that yet. A lot of it's going to depend on what the workload is for actually making it. So that's the end of the sales pitch. Today we're going to talk about a dungeon environment for a low-level AD&D group on page 121. So you're going to run your D&D game and you're trying to decide on an environment. Well, for a low-level group, I like a dungeon because the dungeon limits the vectors of attack for most of your monsters. What does that mean? It means that, for instance, in this corridor, the players can only be attacked from back here or here. Generally, there's going to be much that can get them up there. Now, having just said that, look in the next room. Oh, there's a spider. But the idea is that you want to control the environment where the players can be attacked and in what numbers. So for me, a dungeon is a good example of how to do that because you can limit the encounter. So I've got my player characters here, which would be a druid, a thief, Another thief, both female, but I just happened to grab those figures. A magic user, a fighter, and a cavalier. They are facing off against two human bandits. So they fight the two human bandits and they win and it's all good. Now they've only fought two and we had the two at the front of the party, the fighters, holding them off. The fighters are generally going to have better armor class, better hit points, and better combat ability. That makes them an ideal choice to lead the party. Now, that's great unless they're attacked from behind, but that's why you keep somebody who's kind of a fighter like the cleric in the back. You keep everybody else sandwiched nice and safe in the middle. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to clear these guys out of our corridor. They've slain the, the two defenders. I'm going to move them and show the corridor. And these are some pieces that I've made up over the years from uh, excellent molds called Hearst Arts, where you buy the mold, you pour the mold material in there and then glue them all together and I made up some funky things like these little sliding mirror doors it slides up and out it can sit in the thing or I can pull it out entirely and that gives you a dungeon eye view of what's in the next room so we go into the next room and some kind of tentacle creature coming up out of the well but first there's a spider to deal with this again is a good environment to limit where the attacks can come from. They, it can come from the creature in the well. You decide what its reach is. I'm going to scooch this out of the way. You decide what the creature's reach is, and then you've got the uh, spider itself, and you decide if it works with the creature in the well or if it's just there. You know, what's the deal with the thing in the well? Now, the thing in the well can be a lengthy encounter because even if they kill the creature in the well, there might be something else down there. There could be some treasure down there. They could figure out how to get it. So now I have two ways out of this room. I've got a door right there where they can do the usual stuff. The thieves check for traps, that kind of stuff. And then I've got a section where they've actually, somebody's chopped through the wall into the next room. A prudent party is going to go ahead and go that way. So going this way, they encounter da -da, some drow. Yeah, I've thrown in drow at low levels, as low as second or third. I just make, the drow, make sure the drow are of commensurate low levels and in very light numbers. But draw can be a decent low-level encounter if you want. So now if i am completed this room, my group has been victorious and claimed whatever prizes they, they've gotten. They only have one other choice. 
a new way to get out of here, which would be that doorway, or they could go back out through the hole that they came in through. That would take them, if they go that way, well, let's have them go this way. They go this way, they do the usual good thief stuff, checking for traps, all that stuff. They open the door, and what is in there? Some type of nether creature, maybe a golem. It really depends on you. You don't have to use the figure as described. This particular guy, I will show you. Is it Yagnoloth? I'm certainly not going to throw a Yagnoloth at a low-level group, even a weak one. But it's a good figure that I want to use maybe for some kind of construct. Golem, something like that. Maybe something I've created. So I just used the figure for that. And then again, we have an exit out that doorway. But the party decides, hey, the DM didn't set up that part of the dungeon. We'll go back this way to this doorway. They go to this doorway. They do all their thiefly stuff, or maybe use a knock spell, open the door, go in. There's some type of portal. Standing before the portal, oh my gosh, a type 5 demon, what are we going to do? Well, maybe this is an illusion. Maybe it's just a lesser creature disguised as a type 5 demon. I'm certainly not going to hit the group at low level with a type 5 demon. But if one of them has a web, maybe they could try throwing a web over the type 5 demon. But they gummed up their portal. Oh my goodness. And what's this on the floor? We don't know what that liquid is. When the demon is webbed up and doesn't teleport out, the group's going to have a pretty good clue that it's not really a type 5 demon. And now we have an exit going down the corridor and on into the dungeon. The point of showing all this is to show that you as the DM can control the avenues of attack. You don't have to have your magic users stuck in the middle of a melee and getting demolished because they are attacked from any direction that the monsters want to come in. Even in this room, even, as, even if I go into this room to take on these drow, I've got my fighters in there, my cleric goes up, my mage stays back, maybe one of my thieves starts sneaking around, and the other thief stays maybe to keep an eye on the magic user. There are a lot more avenues of attack, but there are only three opponents, whereas I have six in my party. This, again, is a controlled environment. gives me a much better opportunity to dictate the encounter and dictate the pace of the encounter. So for these reasons, I really feel that it's better to uh, start out a low-level group, especially a brand-new first-level group, in a dungeon. It gets them used to the D&D environment, gets them used to dealing with doorways and what they need to do when they get to them, uh, any kind of spells they might have, like hold portal, uh, to hold the door shut, anything along those lines. Now, I realize that a web is, you have to be third level to cast a web, and I said this is a first of fifth thereabouts. So a dungeon, to my mind, is the best way for me as the GM to control the environment. So now, where are they going to rest? They've had a long, hard day of fighting nasty creatures. Where are they going to sleep? Well, the answer is anywhere they want. Uh, I've had parties just sleep out in a corridor. If it was an area that didn't see a lot of traffic, they would just bunk down in the corridor, set up a sentry on each end, and, and go to sleep. Our sleep periods in our campaign are generally 12 hours, with three four-hour shifts for sentry duty during the night. Everybody gets eight hours, and then the mages have time to study their spells in the morning before everybody disembarks. The mages will generally take the first couple of uh, shifts, or they'll sleep the first few shifts, and then uh, take some time to study their spells. I am not a stickler on 15 minutes per spell level per spell for everyone you're casting back, you're getting back into memory. I think that's excessive. I think that's another example of the uh, DM versus player mentality of the early AD&D books. As long as the, the, the MU isn't trying to recoup literally all his spells, I don't worry that much about how long it actually takes. I'll go ahead and cut him some slack. That's entirely up to you. So now the party's decided they're going to stay in the dungeon overnight, and they're going to rest up in there and then start up in the morning. What we usually will do at low levels is somebody will take some spikes and maybe a mallet. And maybe they'll either spike the door through the stone, depending on how much they're worried about noise, you know, wrap the spike in a cloth for striking it to muffle the sound, or maybe just wedge the door shut. So if, for instance, they were going to sleep in this room, having disposed of whatever that creature was, the doors are both still intact. So this could be an ideal defensible position for the party to rest in. Pull them out. I'm going to put the party in. 
Now they can wedge both doors shut from the inside, set up a sentry on each door, and that's four asleep, two awake per shift in a nice secure area. Some of the stuff you have to worry about in dungeon environments, as brought out in the Dungeon or Survival Guide, is air quality, uh, gases collecting, flooding, anything like that. I don't do that to my players generally. I will sometimes make air quality an issue, but I'll make sure that they know that I'm making it an issue. I'll make it very obvious. I'm not looking to have them die in their sleep from carbon monoxide or anything like that, because again, what's the point? So this would be a nice little defensible room for them, and then if they wanted, they can retrace their footsteps and then go up there, or they can go forward into the unknown through this door. So that's really what I want to show about the dungeon environment and why I feel the dungeon environment is actually better for a DM uh, because you can limit so much stuff and dictate where things are and how things happen. The other thing is, if you're an inexperienced DM, in my opinion, the best place to start is a dungeon. You will be able to create everything, have everything. It's almost like a bottle episode of a TV show. You're able to keep everything right in front of you, right where you want it to be, and the only surprises are going to be what you bring to the table. That's not true in other environments, and I'm, I'm going to take a look at a few other environments in other videos. But uh, today I just wanted to really show a dungeon environment and how they can be a lot of fun, how they can be hazardous, how they can allow you to rest without leaving the dungeon. Just some good stuff all the way around. There we are. So that's really all I've got to say about the dungeon environment. Next one in this series is probably going to be the wilderness environment and why I feel that's a little more dangerous for low level groups. But uh, we'll take that as it comes. So that's all I have to say today for page 121. Please remember to subscribe if you like what you heard and saw. Also, please remember the Patreon reward coming the end of May or early June. And uh, that's all I've got to say today on page 121. Hope you like what you heard and saw, and I'll see you next time.